Hi, this is Still TV broadcasting from Banjul, the Gambia. I am Babu Karsi, welcoming you to another edition of The Viewpoint, where we talk about the latest happenings in and around the globe. On the special edition of The Viewpoint, I have the pleasure to invite, well, a group members, of course, from the United States of America. They are deportees. Yes, you heard me, deportees from the United States of America. Well, just to remind you or recall your mind back that uh, the Gambia government have no other option than to accept deportees from the United States, of course, Gambian citizens, because if they don't, there'll be an embargo levied against them on all government officials uh, traveling abroad. The first batch was 45 of them. They're here, and immediately they landed in the Gambia. The first thing they t thought about was, of course, how to unite themselves, be an association, and work on many different agendas. To tell you, you know it or not, there are about 2,000 Gambians that are awaiting deportation from the United States of America. Of course, joining me on this special edition is Mr. Mohamed Njai, Mr. Momodo Fai, uh, Mr. Buba Jabi, and Mr. Baba Njai. Gentlemen, welcome to the Viewpoint. Thank you, Thank Thank you. you for having us. Well, um, it's a pleasure having you all. Uh, the last time my uh, topic was the Gambians mm -hmm. deported from Germany, and today we are talking about the United States. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I think this was even the first uh, place uh, where, I mean, the, the, the government of the United States signaled the Gambian government under the IHMS regime, mm -hmm. you know, when he refused and there was kind of a travel embargo level against them and stuff. When a barrow came, I guess he has no other option than to accept, if not, you know, <laughs> with, the, with the new government, he will not risk losing, you know, uh, 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 traveling ab uh, abroad, you know, uh, after telling <laughs> us that he, he inherited a government that is almost uh, zero. Uh, but one notion that many authorities uh, will say is, you know, these people were staying, you know, in America illegally mm -hmm. without documents, mm -hmm. you know, and they committed crimes. And that's mm -hmm. why they have to come back. You know, I want us to qualify this before going further. Where will I start? I think I'll start with you. How true is this that you were staying in the U.S. illegally, mm -hmm. you know, without documents, mm -hmm. you know, and then in only order the other you committed crimes, you know, and you were in the record books of the U.S. Police Department? Mm -hmm. Um, we would like to thank you and thank QTV and the listeners and the Gambian populace for inviting us to this forum. Um, again, with regards to the status of deportation, it ranged and it's not as simple as the people are trying to make it, which is being in the country illegally, being a criminal, and you are deported. We wish everything was just that simple. But from the 45 that came, some did have um, um, paperwork as far as legal status to stay in the country, and some lost their legal status based on um, either l um, missing a court date or some lost their legal status due to separation with partners that they have. Some lost their legal status due to not being able to pay for even something as simple as a lawyer, <coughs> or some missed it even due to their lawyer's um, own fault of not uh, filing papers in a timely manner. Then we also have another batch of people that was in the United States for many years trying to file for asylum. And some had their case granted and revoked. And some had their case revoked from the start and was given an order of deportation for over 10 to 15 years. And then we also have another batch of people where some has committed either a minor offense or a major offense. And this, some of it was not deportable offenses. But once the new um, administration came in, which is the Donald Trump administration, some of these non-deportable offenses started to become a deportable offense. So deportation took a drastic change under the new administration. So it's not as simple as the um, Gambian society or the people want to coin it, which is being in the States illegally and committing a crime and you are deported. It varies on every individual case is different. And until the people start addressing every individual <coughs> case, they cannot collectively put the whole deportation in one basket. Okay, I think, I think that, 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 that really qualifies it. Um, I'll come to you shortly because um, your story, it's, it's making headlines. I mean, recently in the Gambia, you know, um, you're coming back home and followed by your wife, who was just one of the most touching stories that everybody is talking about. Uh, but, uh, Mr. Fai, um, you know, when the first thing that came to my mind when I saw you was like, okay, I'm, I'm not sure Mr. Fai will come with any crime that who wanted him to be deported, <laughs> you know. But 
wow, was it expected or was it, were you notified that you'll be deported? And h how was the process like, you know? Well, I feel like they said, uh, cases differ. My case was, I mean, I filed for political asylum, but uh, later withdrew it due to the fact that I was expecting to represent an NGO on the ECOSOC which I lately achieved in uh, 2011. <coughs> this is the reason why I withdrew my case. But as soon as I withdrew it, I was asked to go out of the country. This was in 2011? No. Okay. I left before 2011. That was in uh, 1996. That's okay. when I was asked out of the country. Okay. But due to, I mean, uh, this organization that I was expecting to represent, I mean, I had to stay. So I started representing this organization in 2011, uh, July, shortly before September 11. Okay. So when I started, I mean, the September 11 came, which became very difficult for me to go around offices in, in order to obtain funds for the organization. This was a Gambian organization. The only organization, I mean, recognized by the United Nations. This is why I was killing myself so that, I mean, uh, the country can achieve something from the organization. Not only for the country, but for the entire world. Okay. This is why I do my case. Okay. And then but then I never committed a crime. Okay. A single one. <coughs> no. Nah. Excellent. Uh, let me move on to you. Um. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Ablai. For, for having us here today. Um, there needs to be a lot of clarification that we, we have to make. Um, every story is different. Every immigrant story is different. Every deportee's story is different. Um, I applied for a benefit that we call, that's called political asylum when I left this country in 1995. Uh, it was not based on false hope. <coughs> this was a genuine claim because when I left in 95, that was when the junta came into power. Uh, that was the APRC government. And uh, among the government, my brother was among them, uh, who is also a service member. So a week later down the road, he got arrested and detained. So I couldn't enlist or I couldn't go to school. So I decided to apply for political asylum, and uh, my asylum was denied because I couldn't provide them with sufficient proof, you know, that my brother couldn't, you know, sponsor me to, to, to go to school. <coughs> so I was put on a voluntary departure to leave, uh, which was in 1995. So I stayed. Fast forward to 2018. We all know the, um, the former regime that was here doesn't accept deportees. And we have to make this very clear. You know, we have change of government now, which accept deportees. So people are coming. Uh, and uh, I'm, so, I'm sorry to call you. Is this good that they refuse depends, to accept it depends, uh, deportees? It was who okay you, because then you stay. It depends who you ask. Okay. It depends who you ask. I was part of the uh, the political activists that were engaging, you know, on all fronts to have a system change here. And people will ask me, um, was this a surprise that you've been deported and you, for this, this government that you were fighting for? I said, no, I wasn't surprised. If I have to do it all over again, I'll do the same thing. I'm not doing this for myself. Just like what JFK said, you know, not ask not what you can do for your country. Ask not ask what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. So I'm doing this for my nation. I'm not doing this as an individual person. Uh, another point of clarification that we want to make and we want to emphasize on is all deportees are not criminals. And I insist on this on my last interview, and I'll echo it again, that you know, there are a lot of people within us that were deported have zero criminal record. And I can speak for myself. You know, my 23 years living in the United States, I've never start, stood in a court of law because I had a violation not even traffic violation. So to label us or to see us or to have this stigma that anybody that's deported from Europe is a criminal is false. You know, the, the Gambian people need to understand that. 
and I we need to we need to uh, uh, expound on this that not all returnees, not all deportees are criminals. I'm not one of them, and I know many of my members here are not one of them. Okay, I think that is uh, clear. Uh, let me now see if attention to well, he's the most talked about guy, you know. <laughs> 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 you know, um, how's the feeling like coming back home? Having your family, having to leave everything that they've had here, they've lived on, they've known, to abandon everything and follow you back home. Thanks for that question. First and foremost, I'd like to thank uh, QTV for giving us a platform to talk, and whosoever is watching this TV today or later. <coughs> That's a good question. How does it feel? It was very difficult to be separated or detached from your family, let alone not knowing how long they'll drag on or how long it'll take before the unification. That's one challenge. And it was not easy at all. Um, the second part would be the difficulties that families will go through with the father or the mother being taken away or just absent or deleted from the family activities and finances, work, all of that. So it's, it's, it's not a very easy thing, but thank God Almighty, Alhamdulillah, that we're back home. I'm blessed to have a supporting family behind me here. And when my wife was there, he, she is now here. Um, for the second time within a year, she took a trip with my when she was pregnant with my son, who is six months, uh, six months old now, and they're all here. And I thank Allah the Almighty for making the journey very easy for them to transition from over there to here. And now they're Gambian, American Gambian family. And we are adjusting to um, the surroundings, uh, the culture, and it's, it's ongoing, to be, to be honest. How long have you been in the U.S.? 25, I went 95, like a few of my, uh, besides him, I think he, uh, <laughs> yes, but yes, 95, over 20 some years. And Gambia should be very grateful to welcome us, regardless of our backgrounds, where we are, our education, work ethics and everything. What we have is combined years of experience and expertise that we can bring to the Gambia to build our nation. Where were you deported? Why was I deported? I missed a court date. First of all, I missed an appointment. I was supposed to have a green card, an appointment that I was supposed to go to to get interviewed and um, adjust my status, but I missed that interview. And missing that interview because I moved from one address to another without notifying uh, the immigration system, I was out of luck. That, that's what triggered my deportation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Your story is extraordinary compared to all the others that are currently deported in the country, you know, you have your wife, you know, living in the States, coming home to join you in the Gambia, uh, entirely new background, everything new, you know, what are you going to do now? I mean, work-wise, you know, the culture is totally different for them. How are they going to acclimatize themselves? Uh, that, that was something that was expected from me and from her and from everybody else. It's totally different, but we are human beings, you know. We are able to adopt to situations and circumstances and environments also. Allah gave us that willpower uh, that, that, you know, we can manage or improvise and, and keep life going. So <coughs> it wouldn't be easy, I'm not saying per se. I'm looking for work. Uh, I have a company that I need support. You know, if you need a website, call us. Uh, uh, cloud computing, maybe some of these things we can help. You can help us too to, you know, tr you know um, what do you call it, to get a better footing into society without going to financial burdens. Well, that was going to be my next question. What next? You know, you live in everything like you spent 20 years in the U.S. and then you're back home to start fresh. You know, what next? Where are you going to start from? So some of them were there, I'm sure, <laughs> sending something, remittances and stuff, supporting family members. Mm -hmm. All of that's going to stop. You're going to join them now and then you know, work like them, but what kind of work are you going to do? What are you going to engage on now that the U.S. is a no-go area for you people? Well, uh, uh, <coughs> for me, uh, <coughs> I was fortunate enough 
to have a uh, couple cars back home uh, before I came. Cars and vehicles? Yeah, vehicles. Okay. And then upon my arrival, I was, so I was also able to bring um, at least my personal car that I used back there. You know, so at least a fleet of maybe four or five, you know, depending on. Um, so that's what I'm using for hire. I have two, two a seven-seater minivan and also one luxury um, SUV, uh, BMW 745 series that I use for hire. Um, and also I have two other, you know, local fleets, lo local gilligilis that I'm, I'm also, you know, using as well. So that's, those, are, those are my areas for now, <coughs> you know, just to stay afloat. You know, and help myself to sustain myself and my family for that. Okay. Yeah. And Safai? Mm. Well, unfortunately, I found nothing. I mean, when I arrived, because I mean, everything had gone. So I'm just at zero at the moment. Oh, gone how? God, you say gone what the moment? Ah, well, them is handled. Mm -hmm. To be honest. Family? Yes. So, but I mean, as life goes on. It doesn't bother me much just to start press and uh, keep going. This is important. I'm okay, you know, you were served notifications of leaving the US some years ago, and uh, but you were trying to make life out of it and try to, you know, smuggle in and out there. Um, when the time of deportation came during this Donald Trump's, uh, you know, ruling, were you notified to say, Mr. X, I'm coming to your house on the 6th to pick you up to go? No. Or they just come and, yeah. No. I, I, wa I want this to be clear as well. No. How, how were you deported back Mr. to Gambia? It doesn't, it doesn't work like that. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll, for my case, <coughs> again, um, I was put on a voluntary departure to leave. Um, I didn't leave. But usually what they do is after, after you are put on that proceedings, uh, voluntary departure, whatever proceedings, you know, they will not send you any other notice, in my understanding. In some cases, they might send you a notice for you to leave the country as a reminder. But beside that, they can just come and knock on your door, you know, just take you, take you to detention centers and okay. keep you there till the government can facilitate the travel document for you. You know, and again, I, you know, I'll just go back to the, the old regime, you know, of, uh, of the previous government, whereby they don't accept deportees. Mm -hmm. You know, so that, you know that was one avenue that a lot of us who were who were put on voluntary departure or who were put on deportation in general, you know, were banking on at least maybe you know we had, there might be another chance for us to, you know, maybe uh, renew our status or another avenue to see what other avenues we can take and see if we can familiarize ourselves because I get three kids there. My son is 19. My two girls are 16 and 14. And again, I, like I said, you know, somebody who lives in the States for 23 years with zero crime, you know, some, sometimes you will think that uh, those little offenses or those little uh, things, you know, you will not be deportable. But when Donald Trump came, it's a whole, uh, a whole <laughs> new ball game. <laughs> and also with the change of government as well, we cannot blame Donald Trump on all these issues. You know, <coughs> it's a collaboration. It's, mm. uh, it's, it's diplomacy. You know, we understand, on the other hand, Donald Trump want to deport, but we also must understand, on the other hand, that our own government is now issuing tr us travel documents to deport its citizens. Before, that was not the case. So there will never be a notice whereby, you know, they'll call you, Mr. Njai, be prepared, you're going to so and so date now. And that's what we, we, we're hoping, maybe in the future, whereby, I even told my deportation officer, I said, did he get my travel documents to deport me? And he said, no. I said, why don't you arrange with me? Because he knows me. He comes to my job place. We sit down and talk. Why don't you sit with me and tell me, Mr. Njai, prepare yourself. We're coming for you a week or two months down the road. I will. I cannot sacrifice my family or my kids not to return home. I have nothing to lose. Mm -hmm. There's no place like home. But we <coughs> want to have a proper process when these things are done. But that's not the case. Now that you're back home, um, well, the federal government definitely have to agree to the U.S. Mm -hmm. and as, you, as he rightly put it, the diplomacy way. If not, mm -hmm. <laughs> they themselves will, will, will suffer. And, um, since you came home, what was the response like from the government? Have they even approached you to say, Mr. X, Y, Z, let's see how to help? And has that happened? Well, since we came home, um, again, we want to make also a point clear as part of the Faces Empowerment Movement theme that we are not against deportation. 
We want to make that clear. We're not against deportation. Why? Because Gambia deports. America deports. Deportation is part of life. It's everywhere. Mm -hmm. What we are against is the process of deportation, how people are handled and mishandled. What we are against is, against is we have today, as me and you are sitting having this interview, our Gambian brothers and sisters in camps and detention centers that are with criminals, if we're talking about criminality, and have never committed a crime. We have Gambian brothers and sisters today as we are talking that their meal is not adequate. It's not adequate for them to eat. It's not sufficient for them to make it. We have Gambian brothers and sisters as we are talking right now in those camps that are being abused. Some physical, some emotional, and being beaten, being put in cages, being stripped naked, being pepper maced. These are the things of why we decided to form something. We're saying the issue is not about deportation. So we don't want the nation to make this about deportation. We want the nation to make this story about human beings being treated like human beings in the process of deportation. And on your question with regards to the government assisting or how they received us, when we first arrived at the airport, the only officials that was there was the immigration officials. But the immigration officials, when we requested, because in the U.S. we was told that they had our travel documents. Some of us never seen it. When we requested it, they always claim, when you get to the Gambia, the officials would give you the documents. Okay. When we arrived, we asked. We never saw our travel documents for most of us. So which is against um, human rights and is against also U.N. laws for a human being to be air transported without a travel document from one nation to another. So this was one thing a lot of the deportees was holding on to, like, you cannot take me from the U.S. to the Gambia without a travel document. So can you please present to us the travel document? So up to today, as I'm sitting, me and many other people have never seen our travel documents. So the second thing, the government officials that was there, they never assisted us with um, contacting our families. So most of us came through this flight without a single phone number because in the U.S., my personal self, I had a piece of paper that I wrote my family's contact numbers on. So when we was boarding on the plane, they strip searched us, removed all the papers, and ripped it. We told them our contact numbers are there. They said, well, when you get to the country, you'll figure it out. So when we arrived, we had de deportees that because we're in the new era where everything is stored in cell phones, so if you don't write it down, you would not be able to call your family. So we had deportees at the airport that could not contact their family. And the government officials that received us, soon as they checked our names, most of them was in vehicles and went home. So me, my brother, and a couple other people stayed there. Some of the taxi drivers that was there offered to take some of these deportees back to their family compounds. But the, not being here 23 years, most of us did not know where to even turn to, what direction to take, who to call. So one of the deportees that was with us, my brother and myself, was driving around for 40 minutes looking for their home. This is one place government could have helped us. And um, helping us contact our families, this is another place government could have helped us. Some of the deportees did not have a place to stay that night. So when the airport doors was closed, they was walking around in the airport. Homeless, being deported from America, come to the Gambia, and you're walking around in the airport facility. One, not good for security. Two, this person, we had individuals that wanted to kill themselves upon arrival. And these individuals need mental health uh, rehabilitation. They need mental institutions to be there. This is another thing the government did not do. Um, upon arrival, um, the, what we did, some of the deportees, he was one of them, put the little bit of money that they had left and paid for a hotel for the other deportees to stay there. So a place for the deportees to stay for one week, two weeks, 30 days, this is something government could have helped, but there was no help. And then upon um, getting out of the airport phase, trying to reintegrate with the society, most of us, after 23 years, you don't have a birth certificate, you don't have a passport, you don't have an ID, and you need all of this to travel through in and out the country or to get things you need. 
So to even have a driver's license or um, identification, we don't have the original documents to present. So some people took them eight months to even try to get any kind of form of paperwork to be legal in this country. So this is another place government could have helped and did not help. So the government, we did not receive any help from them in those areas. And then when we first came, you know, the push and pull was who deported us. Why are we deported? But we formed a group to stay away from that narration and to get to the narration <coughs> of we still want to progress as human beings. We still want jobs. We still want to add value to our society because all of us sitting here was the people sending money to this society. And the remittances of this society that we were sending is what kept this economy going forward. So when we come back, we're not looking for financial reward. We're looking for assistance to have a soft landing so we could get ourselves back up and start working in this society to be better human beings and to be able to take care of our families we left behind and the ones that was counting on us here. Some of us, again, the ones that was helping their families here, they arrived, stayed with their family, and when they could no longer help their family, they was kicked out of that home. So we have... Has that happened? Has yeah, happened? Yeah, yes, yeah, it has yeah. already A guy that has been held supporting the family, yes. being deported, and the family keeping out. Yes. Mm -hmm. Whoa. It, it happened. So we have people that have mentally lost their own understanding and rationale. We walked past them, came on the same flight, met them at the market, call him by the name, why haven't you been coming to the meetings? I've already lost my mind, you're telling me about meetings, meaning rationally, he was just walking up and down the street. So what we want the Gambian society to understand is, and the government itself, stop focusing on why somebody is deported. Focus on the human need during deportation and after deportation. Because at the end of the day, you're dealing with human beings. And if you don't assist them, in getting back up and strengthening themselves, then the criminality you're worrying about could end up infesting your society because you are pushing them to a corner of no return. The last hope they have in life is their Gambian family. If, if the whole world rejects you, <coughs> if the United States rejects you and don't want you in their country again, <coughs> upon that flight when we was returning, everybody on that plane was saying, well, I didn't want to be deported but at least I'm going home. This was the slogan in the plane. At least I'm going to people that speak the same language with me. I'm going to people that eat the same food with me. But to arrive and you are being investigated again. Investigated how? Well, we're not <laughs> sure. I mean, how do you mean? Meaning <laughs> investigation in the sense of you hoping, if a child hurt himself, they're hoping the mother would take them and comfort them and heal them until that wound is healed. But you're not gonna come home with an injury and somebody start beating you mm -hmm. for being injured. Investigation meaning, don't come from deportation. It's a serious process. We had people that had their leg broken in the process. We was chained in shackles from um, hands to toes. If you want to use the bathroom, two officers have to walk you or you would fall down. That was going to be my next question. How true is it that you put on cuffs? Chains? Cuffs. <laughs> this is not cuffs. <laughs> okay. This cuffs. Are chains. cuffs. I mean, all of you? This way are chains. Cuffs Everybody in the, on, on body plane. Cuffs Everybody. would have been very uh, comfortable. And comfortable. <laughs> well, this was chains. what they do. This way are chains, not cuffs alone. They would say chains. You have to be cuffed in the hands, a chain in your wrist. They chain on your foot. What they do, they take the handcuffs, put it on your hand, and first off, they have to tighten it so that your wrist cannot turn. So you're, the whole time traveling, how many hours was 16. it? 16, 16, 16 hours. Your 16 wrist is like, you, 16. Cannot, you cannot turn your wrist. And then that cuff that they put on your hand, they have to attach a chain to it and make sure it's less than two inches from your body so you can't move your hands. <coughs> and then that same chain, they have to sit you down and chain it to your leg where as soon as you stand up, you can't even take a step forward because the chain to your leg is chained so tight that you have to hop to get anywhere. So officers have to hold you up to take steps because you cannot even move. And those chains, like we had a deportee that had a, a broken wrist that was chained and the chain didn't fit and they end up squeezing it to a point. He was screaming for medical help and no assistant came to him. 
So we're talking about what happens during deportation. We're talking about what happens after deportation. We're not talking about why, because the reasons of why is many. But we want the people to focus on what happened to these people as a human being. Because regardless of why they are deported, they're here. Yes, and they're Gambians. And they're Gambians. And the Gambians. Gambians yeah. So upon arrival, we're just looking for our Gambian society to embrace us as human beings because we've been rejected somewhere else. Yep. And, and, and uh, just, to, just to take up with where Mr. Njai left it, uh, this is why we're not, we're not worried about who signed what, if you ask me. Mm -hmm. I don't care whether it was signed by a foreign affairs, from a former minister, or whether it was signed by a so-and-so minister. We don't want to have the same repeat. What we went through, that's why we came together and formed this organization. Our experience is we want to make sure when our brothers and sisters come, they have a soft landing. And this is why we formed this organization. You know, there's a lot of things that went wrong. Uh, we're not here for a blame game, but I think a lot of things that went wrong could have been fixed. And we're not seeing any avenue that the government is doing to fix those, those wrongs, as we speak. <coughs> but this it, it, left me it left me wondering, me. because um, those deported from European countries, you know, are going into reintegration processes and stuff. Uh, why not the U.S.? <laughs> that that, 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 that yeah. goes to my mind. Yeah, that's the biggest question. Why not the U.S.? That's mm. the biggest question. Because, I mean, uh, those returnees, as they call them, instead of deportees, we are deported, and uh, those are returned from uh, those who are going by the back way. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think they are compensated somehow. I learned, them, I mean, uh, if you have an agreement with them to come back home, I mean, uh, they'll give you something. To start up something. To start up something. Mm -hmm. But we don't have that. The soft landing that you have mentioned that uh, I mean, our future brothers who are supposed to come to avoid them having such I mean, a landing that we had, they will not be able to have it if you don't fix the problem here. That's why we came as a group to give them that soft landing. But we have to get support from the government in order to give them a soft landing. Mm. In the sense that we want to have I mean, at least a house where we can shelter them, take care of them for at least a period of 90 days so that their minds could be free and come home before they can reintegrate with their families. If we can also get a transport from the government to transport them from the airport to wherever they can be sheltered would be very good. But all this is not coming. So if you don't have that, we can also give. We cannot also give them a soft landing. Mm -hmm. I this so I, I because I, I, I mean that, mm -hmm. that's a point here. That is a journalist that was attacked at Union Airport that was by, our by, by 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 German deportee. That was our own <laughs> crew. Okay. Yeah. Now, had we got that access, mm -hmm. we would have been there Talk to, to comfort them. these people. Mm -hmm. within the airport before they come out. This is where the objective is. Mm -hmm. okay. But this is not happening. So how can we give them a soft landing? We'll come to that shortly. Um, um, <coughs> the issue of the documentary, there was a brilliant documentary that was done uh, by a journalist, you know, uh, when your wife and kids were coming down to the Gambia. We'll take time to uh, watch that. In, um, it, it means a lot and says a lot. I mean, a lot of Gambians really, you know, felt it when they watched it in a this is something i've been preparing for the past six to seven months as the waves lap against the shores of the gambia in western africa for 32 year old katrina jabby it's been a long journey to get here just watching my girls on the beach Beautiful. I would lay in bed and envision this moment on my darkest days. A year ago, her husband was suddenly deported from the United States, and Katrina began a quest to reunite her daughters Aisha and Nalia and son Noble with their dad, even if it meant leaving behind her own mother and father back home. Just 24 hours before, she was in Wisconsin saying goodbye to her mother Judy. 
So we wanted to come down here and take a walk along the river. I grew up coming here and walking, fishing actually along this river, so. That's one of my mom's fondest memories. We thought we'd come here with the kids one last time before we end up in Africa. Before they leave, Grandma wants to give the children some heartfelt mementos. Can we say goodbye to Grandma? Give her some big hugs. Love you. I feel like this guilt, like all the way around for everybody. I'm just trying to make everybody happy. I feel like I want the kids to be happy. I want to make sure like my mom is happy. My husband's happy. Her husband, Buba, was deported to his native country of the Gambia last March. He'd been in the U.S. for more than 20 years. He'd overstayed his original visa, but spent the last decade trying to legalize his status, reporting to immigration officers every year. The next morning, Katrina's dad, Dave, helps her wrap it all up. He and his wife are sad to see her go, but hope Katrina's plight can help to change government policies. Breaking of families, it's wrong. It's just simply wrong. There was discussion of the fact that Buba wasn't a legal citizen of the United States, and we, under, we knew all this, but I just never thought that he would ever get deported because he was going to immigration twice a year like he was supposed to. He was following his responsibilities. Determined to keep her family together, Katrina sold most of her belongings, including her house, in order to reunite with Buba in the Gambia. The family endures two long flights over a day-long journey to get to their new home. Welcome to the Gambia with a local time here, just approaching 7.20 in the evening. It's been a year since the girls have seen their father, and the little brother has never met his dad. But after months of agonizing waiting, the moment has finally come. Africa has been waiting for you. Hey, see daddy now? I've been anticipating this moment for over a year and not only anticipating it, but planning it. Planning everything about this and envisioning it and um, it's just, it's, it's emotional. Um, it's overwhelming. So I'm really excited and happy and I'm glad it's over with. <laughs> Thank you. It's been a lot of work. You're brave. Love you. Thank you. My superwoman. <laughs> Love you. <laughs> Our super mom. <laughs> hey. The next morning is the start of a new life for the family in Gambia. It's Friday, a day of prayer in this Muslim country. This is day one for Katrina and the kids in Gambia, and we're in Senegambia, just outside the capital. And this is a neighborhood that's considered well-to-do, middle-class, but still very different environment from what Katrina and the kids are used to. Hello. Hi. Let's go up. Trina's awake. So are the girls. Hi, people. Do you want to go see the chickens outside? Katrina is already getting her house in order. I have to familiarize myself with what we have going on here, but it's just the basics, really. I actually shipped um, some cereals and stuff, stuff a while back, so my husband set these up. And um, we actually need to go shopping today. We need to go to the market and find some things for the kids, like milk and more water and maybe some items to make like a dinner that they're familiar with, like spaghetti or um, maybe we can find some mac and cheese. <laughs> and shopping here couldn't be more different from Wisconsin. Oh, we're just looking for some smoked fish. Katrina says life here may be simple, but family values are strong and those are values she wants to instill in her children. But as the day starts to wind down, and despite her excitement, reality is beginning to set in. Just being in the Gambia now with my husband and for him to be with the children, it's a relief. 
we have a lot to adapt to, and I know that this experience isn't going to be the sunshine and beach <laughs> and palm trees, that there's more to it and that we'll have to get used to. But as of today and as of right now, I'm just enjoying every single moment. Now that the association is formed, the Face East Empowerment Movement, you know, what do you aim to achieve? I understand you want to prepare yourselves now that you're the first bite that came, you know, to prepare for those coming up. The issue of the chains and the handcuffs is another thing, but when they land at the Bahamian International Airport, this is something else. You know. okay. Have you been in contact with the government when this association was formed? And how many people, by the way, are in this association? Is it the whole 45? Uh, 20 something. We started with the whole 45, but it was very hard for people to either get themselves to the meetings. Everybody was dealing with different issues, different challenges. Um, and we're growing right now. We do have Gambians that are volunteering right now to make sure that this foundation stands because they understand what we're trying to do. And they're volunteering their time, their efforts for free to make this happen. Uh, next time, if we knew that we could sit four people here, we probably would have two of those volunteers here to represent us as well because we are growing, okay? And even yesterday, I was talking to a guy who's fixing my car right now, who that guy referred me to. He fixed his car before. You know, there's people out here that they have a mindset that we need to, you know, propel, get this country elsewhere than where we are today because there's a lot of dysfunction, dysfunctional, dysfunctionalities in society right now that could be fixed, either from what we learn or what from f f what good things that we see from elsewhere. Just copy and paste those things in our society and get us <coughs> going somewhere. The government needs to help. Okay, we're not asking for or claiming that they owe us something or somebody gave them something that they were supposed to give to us. It's not the case, but like. If you have people coming, deportees coming, uh, some of us are fortunate, some of us are not. He has engagements, he's, you know, he has a company he's running. Um, Mr. Njai over here also is running m and And Mr. Fay here got disappointed, okay? Personally, I have stuff that are here that could generate me money and my family to sustain us but it was incomplete. I'll, I'll cut this short. I wanted to bring five containers or four, but I only had one here. I have stuff left over in America. I have cars over there. Uh, I have a car over there. I had a truck over there that I had to sell. So in other words, we, we are trying to build foundations. We've been building. The reason I'm saying this is the government, we need help, not personally, but for our organization to to help others that are coming, not to go through what we went through. Personally, I got sick. This brother here got sick. Mm -hmm. Our last leg of tra travel, they transported us to these places to get us sick before we leave to come to our countries, which is very inhumane. Mm -hmm. I have medications, I post on Facebook that they gave me, on the, uh, they gave, gave me these extra medications on the plane. And some people were not even fortunate to get medications. Why maybe why in my own case, maybe I was not a threat to them, small person or whatever, and, and the way I communicate with them. But somebody else, let's say if you stutter, mumuno, whatever, could mm -hmm. bibi. Mm -hmm. So some people have difficulties getting what they need because of even like the way they present themselves or the way they think they, they, they're becoming a threat to, 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 to the people that are supposed to be facilitating their medication and food and all that stuff. So there's a lot of challenges. Back to the government. All we need is welcome us and know that if you send all these Gambians deported back to the Gambia, please have something for them to do or let FIM or other organizations prepare a platform where people can get on with their lives. Soft landing, that's what we're asking. So they are watching and um, I hope uh, with the, the same thing they've done with the, the European deportees or returnees, will be, of course, extended to the, those that are coming from the uh, United States. Um, that takes me to the issue of the association form, uh, the Face East. How did the name come about, Face East? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. 
Maybe you can. Well, How about a face <laughs> east? <laughs> well, face east. Face, face, logical. face yeah. east. Break it down <laughs> empowerment <laughs> movement is just as the name says. The reason is um, all of us was in the West. And the reason we go to the West is to look for greener pastures. We're looking for a better way of life, looking for higher education, looking for ways to empower ourselves and our family that we've left behind. We are from the East, meaning we are of African um, descent. And what, w upon realization on our way back, you know, when we've lost all hopes and sitting and talking amongst ourselves, which we all know that almost all the natural resources that the world utilizes comes from Africa. There's natural resources everywhere else, but majority of it is stored in our lands. And as we are leaving our land and our continent, going to look for better things, the Western people are coming to our lands looking for the better things we have. So upon that realization, we realize that we are migrating in the wrong direction. Because if we are migrating looking for better pastures, and the people we go into are coming to our lands to look for better pastures for their lands, then maybe we need to concentrate on our lands and see what we could do to empower the, um, our lands, empower our nations, empower our government, empower our people, so that the whole planet would be directed to where their resources are. So we could better manage these resources. So we could better utilize these resources. So Face is Empowerment Movement is an organization that is trying to tell the youth that you don't have to go to the West to be empowered. You don't have to migrate to be empowered, but migration is part of life. So we're going to form a movement that's going to help the first batch of people that are going to be <coughs> deported. And from these deportees and from the nationals of the nation, we would form an organization that would allow uh, uh, economic development, that would allow the education to be better developed, mm -hmm. that would allow everything the government is doing, we want to be a partner with them in that. Because the deportees coming, the 2,000 people we're talking about, some of them are actually teachers, never committed a crime. Some are doctors. Was a he was a teacher. Okay. And some are, some are university uh, um, teachers, and some are doctors, some are nurses. We had another one that came with us. She's a nurse. So she? she is a I was nurse. Gonna ask, was it all guys? No, we female? had we had over six females. No, five. Five, five. Yeah. yeah. So some are nurses and some have been in the nursing industry for twenty something years. So this twenty something years, if the government tapped into it mm -hmm. and utilized that experience, experience, immediately you could change. Even if you take one ward and put that sister there, she could do something in that one ward that wasn't there for twenty five years. Absolutely. So we want to tell the people that we are empowered with experience and we want to utilize that experience to help empower the nation. Mm -hmm. So we want to be part of the national development plan that the government has. We want a chapter in there mm -hmm. that says deportees and returnees could develop their nation. We want a chapter in there that say when they return, help them. Example, like he was saying, we have deportees that have spent 20 something years working had a house there, had cars there, had their clothes there, had everything. When you are deported, you are deported with what you are wearing. You no longer have a clothes to wear the next day. <coughs> so upon arrival, please give them five, six clothes to wear. And then the rest of the stuff they have over there, because they just lost their job. Mm -hmm. In the U.S., we live what we call check to check. Meaning when you get paid, you pay paycheck, your bills, paycheck. you pay the few things, and you almost have zero dollars. <laughs> People who are think zero dollars to see the next week. So you're working in debt. Soon as your paycheck comes, you pay your debts. So upon deportation, everything they built for 23 years, the cars, they start being taken away. The clothes that they had, it goes for some people in the trash because this guy doesn't have $500 to send his clothes back to the Gambia. He doesn't have 300 <coughs> to return the items he has. So these things is what we're saying that we need help for the government, government to yeah. facilitate. Talk to the officials in the U.S. Can you gather all their items? Can you give them times to put their items together? Mm -hmm. And we, the government, would help them return it. He had three containers full of tools. He lost all of it because he cannot bring them. 
those tools yeah. would have been benefiting Gambia and Gambians. And, and, and that brings me to, uh, you know, the same point Njai was talking about. When we first arrived, we were uh, granted duty waivers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Out of the 45 deportees, maybe three or five get that duty waiver and they, they, they stopped it. So what happened to and some of us? Yeah, yes. at, at, at foreign, affairs. Foreign, affairs. foreign affairs actually <coughs> gave us that, uh, uh, you know, waivers. But out of the 45 deportees, maybe it was only three or five, and the rest probably have their, you know, you know, items or properties sitting in there. They cannot bring them home, or they brought it home and it's still not paid. GRA probably having an, an open system in their system, or an outstanding balance that needs to be paid by foreign affairs and they cannot get paid because they, they, they have decided to cancel that duty waiver. You know, so these are some of the things that, w that we, we are asking for go to engage the government on. You know, if you're going to issue somebody a duty waiver, don't be selective. You cannot issue duty waiver to only three, four, five people out of 200 or 100 people that are going to be deportees. What's the rationale behind it? You know, I mean, I think it should be th this. I mean, for me personally, you ask me, I'll see it as selective justice. Because if he's given a duty waiver, I'm not. What's the difference between me and him? We're all deportees. Yes, you know, we'll so like it if that can that, be you know, extended. The government you know? needs to look into as well mm -hmm. and help us, you know, and help those that are coming and facilitate this better. Because more people are coming. Oh, yes, we're talking about 2,000. They that because they're accepting them. And they issue travel documents to bring them home. Someone watching this interview right now will be like, wow, these people have spent 20 to almost 30 years in mm -hmm. the U.S. I mean, 100 years right here. 100 years. Yes, U.S. served with, right but, but yeah. you served with notice of, yeah. you know, or yeah, you were rejected. Ago, yeah. You were rejected. And you still want to be there. Let me talk for over time. Be Let me go to another new chain and stuff. Yeah, that's the question someone watching now will be asking. I mean, no, I, mean, I, talk I, I, can, I think I can answer question. that perfectly. Uh, <laughs> if somebody is thinking that line, I have a family of four. Mm -hmm. My son is 19. My two born, born in the U.S.? Yeah, all born in the U.S. Yeah. Okay. My two daughters are 16 and 14. And these are all A students. These people's life is more important to me at that time, at that material time, than just to pack up and bring them all back home. It's not easy. If it's me alone, just, mm -hmm. just for example, just me alone. So you prefer I'll, being I'll, deported? I'll pack up and come back home. Okay, okay. But I cannot just pack a whole family like that and bring them home to a country I didn't know for 23 years, to a country I've been lived for 23 years, to a country that half of my life I've lived outside. That doesn't make sense. And to tag on to that, um, <coughs> what, what, what he's saying is the reason everybody is leaving Gambia to go to the West is because we have a lot of struggles. That's mm -hmm. why you have Gambians dying in the back way, mm -hmm. because the economy of the Gambia cannot sustain its population. So if you have an economy that can sustain its population, two things, either the people start robbing each other, Killing each other to which eat, which is happening at the moment. Which I is got, already got, happening in the game. I Gambia. got robbed twice. So mm -hmm. yeah, which he's already twice. got robbed twice since being here, which is already happening. Or the people look for a better way to digni with dignity to take care of themselves and their family. So when they was given an order of deportation, it's not that they didn't want to come back. All of us wanted to come back. We love the Gambia, mm -hmm. but. What come back to what? To? I definitely what wanted to come, come home. Come back to what? You cannot get a job in, like the, civil yeah. in, the, in the government because mm -hmm. most of those positions are filled. And they're filled with people they know and people they want to give the jobs to. The really? Yeah, yeah, tell, we'll, most tell, of we'll tell you more. We know the corruption <laughs> in the Gambia. Oh. So, <laughs> so <laughs> the other... We can leave that for another day. <laughs> yeah. At least we can extend this program to two hours. We've definitely run out of time. Wish so. um, uh, a lot of you watching, you know, have learned and I'm so have definitely failed it. I just have one message and actually to say um, um, families back home, you know, these are people that have you know, definitely changed the lives of many back home. They have been sending so remittances so and a lot of things. So when they come back, definitely there's no reason why we should not accept them back to society. You know, um, um, <coughs> let's say want to say you want to say one or two words before we say bye we just have two minutes to go i i yeah, just in closing um i know there's more to elaborate on but just in closing um we want to engage the government that's why we formed this organization and uh if the government is listening we want to have an audience with, with them, them today 
Oh. Meaning, I'm, I mean it mm. now. Mm -hmm. you okay. know, not tomorrow, not, not next week, but, not but, next but, month. Now. No. But now. Sure Thank you very it. much, uh, Gambia. That's all I have time for today's edition of the uh, Viewpoint. Well, government officials, I'm sure you're watching. Um, you're doing a lot, but more needs to be done. And I guess uh, what they're asking for is definitely genuine. You know, hence you have... Uh, well, went into deals with the United States government, you know, when they are sending them back home, the stuff that they have back uh, in the U.S. should be definitely facilitated to be bring back home so that they can start something better. Till I come your way next week, my name is Babu Garcia. Thanks for watching. Bye for now. <laughs>